Hi, folks. Well, this week's column is on the rather hazy, nebulous, indistinct subject of labour and culture, or labour culture. And given the huge economic challenges we face and all that's going on in politics, you might think that this is a rather self-indulgent, abstruse thing to be writing about. I'd like to convince you otherwise. Because what I mean by culture is the emotional connection between us and a party, or in due course, perhaps, almost certainly, a government. My concern is that Labour at the moment is simply coming across as too dry, arid, bloodless, abstract and emotionally disconnected, a party of technocrats. And by the way, this allows the Tory narrative that Labour and the left generally are a group of kind of North London intellectuals who don't understand the deep country or the real country. That allows that some credence. So I think it is important politically. I know the right honourable gentleman rarely leaves North London. Yeah. But if he does, but if he, if he does, he will know that there are deprived areas in our rural communities, in our coastal communities. But this is not really about Labour and the next election. It seems to me that in the course of the last couple of weeks, yet again, we've seen a shift even at the heart of government, even in Westminster, people think the country has effectively now turned its back on the Conservatives. How do you feel about Boris Johnson? Well, I wouldn't be selling it for the <laughs> No, you can't put that in your mouth. Something pretty profound has happened, and it's Johnson, and it's the parties and the lies and all of that, but it's above all the cost of living crisis and the current mortgage crisis that they're going through and the mistakes made by the Bank of England. All of those things together have created the kind of assumption, even inside the Conservative family, that there is going to be a change. I think Labour, as I've said for months now, are going to form the next government. I want to add 2024 as the next date for the next bold reform in Labour government. It's more about what happens after that, because Labour are going to inherit an absolute mountain of problems, a real world of horror. Economically, our economy is too small, inflation is deeply rooted, there's Brexit and our disconnection with our nearest big market, profound problems in the supply chain, public services of all kinds desperately needing investment and no obvious source of that investment. What do we want? So I think Labour... In the mid-2020s, a Labour government is going to have a really, really hard time. And during that period, it's going to need those of us who emotionally support it to emotionally support it, to feel that the people in charge are our people, speaking for us in our kind of language. We need to root for them, and they will even more need us to root for them. And that is all about culture. It's about an emotional connection with the people running the Labour Party and the project itself. Now, you can't divorce this, obviously, from policy. And some of the extremely cautious, uh, economically conservative positions Labour's taking are going to be a real problem for the party, and we have to have those arguments out. But it strikes me that actually if you look at the people near, at or near the top of the party, if you look at Keir Starmer himself, you know, son of a toolmaker, son of a nurse, from a relatively impoverished working class background who fought and kicked his way up by grit, hard work, brains, determination. If you look at Angela Rayner and her extraordinary backstory, if you think of Rachel Reeves, who was in the New States from very recently, talking to the editor, comprehensive schoolgirl who's always had to flourish in a world of patronising posh boys. If you think of Wes Streeting, absolutely extraordinary origins of Wes Streeting in the East End of London, and many, many more right across the Labour front bench, these are united by being people from ordinary, lower middle class or working class backgrounds without the posh connections who've got where they are by determination, really hard work, self-discipline. Um, and courage. These are, in other words, actually emblems of what the country needs. And I think moving from the current government and the previous governments into a position where they are the people running the country will feel enormously different just by itself. They are good storytellers in private. Most of them are very good storytellers. But somehow they are not telling their own stories or a wider story in public. And that's what I mean by culture. 
I don't mean traditional labor culture, because for most people, there is a kind of weird, jumbled, hazy mix of images that come up, nostalgic images about 1945 and Nye Bevan in full South Walesian spate, that extraordinary oratory, or Crossland and Jenkins, all those uh, composite motions being referred back in labor conference, or Fabianism, pipe smoke, tweed, all of that. Traditional labor culture is, let's be honest, a bit thin gruel, and it's not really for these times. We are in new times now. And all of that, which would have been almost lacking in any visual punch without the, the drama of trade unionism, that is a previous time. But what I do think is that if you look at the project that needs to be achieved, which is basically the rebuilding of Britain, and if you look at the people who are offering themselves to do that, who are basically lower middle class and working class people who've got there on merit, then there's a very simple story that Labour needs to tell more clearly, and it's called class. This is a government which can come in and do things for ordinary people and has to make again and again the argument this is a class-based material movement. I think there are wider lessons, things that Labour needs to think about more generally in terms of its aesthetic, what it feels like, what it looks like, what it sounds like, Labour is a party fundamentally rooted not in the think tanks or the salons of central London, but in the Midlands and the north of England, and indeed central and industrial Scotland and Wales as well. And it needs to go back and think about that. It needs to be a fundamentally materialist movement, always looking in this age of abstraction and AI, and we have a great piece on AI in the New Statesman this week, but in this age of abstraction, Labour needs to be a material movement. It needs to think about what things look and sound like in, in the three-dimensional real world. It needs to talk about you know, breakfast clubs and music tuition for working-class kids in school and sports fields and the look and the restoration of shabby high streets. It needs to think more about architecture and the actual material conditions of the country surrounding us. And the more it does that, I think the more it makes the emotional connections it needs to make. So that's one thing. I think there is an enormous danger for centre-left politics at the moment, which is connected to this, which is the so-called culture wars. The Church of England have called Winston Churchill a white supremacist. We have been talking about the teacher who called a girl despicable because she wouldn't accept that a classmate identified as a cat. Now, this might seem uh, an unpopular thing to say, but I really think, faced by the culture wars, which are being generated from American universities in particular and imported into this country, and appear to me to be almost like a conspiracy by the right to demoralise, divide the centre-left, the liberal left, and turn it against itself. Labour needs to think very hard about this. And I think to delineate properly the, the realms of the private, the realms of the intimate, which are about sexuality, uh, deep identity, and the realms of the more normally public, which are mostly about class and economics, and keep that distinction and try to avoid being caught in an endless and impossible war which simply grinds people down, turns them against each other, and ends up very, very badly weakening the centre-left. That's another thing that I think Labour has to do. And finally, I think it's important for Labour to think more seriously about culture in the traditional way. We are going through a period in this country where, although the, the English novel is in a poor condition, I think, we have a fantastic renaissance on the stage in theatre and in television and film writing, an enormous amount of exciting stuff going on. We are living in an age of wonderful festivals, great, great musical festivals and an absolute flourishing of live music in this country. And when I think back to earlier generations of Labour people, let's not say leaders, let's say Labour people, people like, you know, uh, Neil Kinnock and Roy Hattersley, they would be absolutely thrilled by what's happening. Barbara Castle, where she's still with us, would be shooting around festivals up and down the country, brimming with glee about the, the quality of television and stage writing at the moment. And I just think Labour needs to be more excited about what's going on. So this is really a column calling for more openness, less constriction at the centre, allow people to tell their own stories, be a little bit less disciplined. I'm not calling for an ideological punch-up week after week in public. That would be ridiculous. People to be a little bit um, less disciplined, a bit more emotional, and make politics a little bit more fun. Because without that emotional connection, I say again, la a Labour government in the mid-2020s is going to find life almost intolerably difficult. 
Well, thank you very much indeed for watching and listening to this. We at The New Statesman really value your comments and your input. So if you've got something to say about that strange, red-faced, big-eared, jug-eared old maniac you've been listening to, go to the comments below. Um, if you like what you're hearing, please press the like button. And above all, please subscribe. Brought to you by Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Experienced wealth managers who go above and beyond to guide and support you. Can do is more than just an attitude. Can do is navigating today for a brighter tomorrow.